This meeting is being recorded. Yeah, that's right. Uh, 2022 uh, Corsair uh, 760. Good. Excellent. So um, let's first talk about uh, how to get going racing. Um, I'm going to kind of zip through this. Um, so step number one, you got to join a club or a club. Uh, most of the big races require that you be in a yacht club of some kind. So, you know, Northwest multi Association is... 30 year bucks the first year, 60 bucks every year thereafter, which is kind of similar, I think, to Sloop Tavern, which is another yacht club you could join that's relatively low cost. But uh, you could also join CYC. Anybody know what the, the big clubs charge per year nowadays? I got them up here. Yeah. I, I think I, uh, was Tacoma Yacht Club wants 250 plus bucks a month, no, a year. CYC okay. used to be 300, I think, but that's been a while ago. Uh, okay. And you, and most of those clubs have, or at least CYC, they have different packages, right? So if you're a hardcore right. racer, you want to do every single race that's there. You know, so you spend a little more money because it covers entry fees. Um, and then you know if you want to just do a certain series, you, there's a lesser fee. Right. 540 USD. Okay. I'm a member. And, and I'm, Northwest I'm a, Multi is the cheapest thing going for getting a qualified club. Yeah. Probably. I'm a member at CYC Edmonds. It's uh, $65 a year, but it gets you the reciprocals, the same as CYC Seattle. Huh. Whoa. That's not a bad deal. But I, they do have some races that are all free for club members, but it's it's pretty like beer can ish. It's not real serious like Vince stuff, but. Still pretty fun. All right, so we got a bunch of clubs you could join. Nice to join a club near where you're at. Um, then you got to get a rating, and so you got to go to the PHRF site, PHRF Northwest, and there's a form for getting a rating. And you fill out the form, send it into PHRF with 65 bucks if you're not already a member, and they'll send it to me. And I will pull a rating right out of my behind. And then you will be able to go racing. Now, that is, we probably ought to have a little discussion about rating. Uh, I'm super uncomfortable with the whole PHRF rating thing um, because it seems uh, so unscientific. You know, you kind of hold up your thumb and you kind of look at it and you see where people are and you say, well, like, you know, when I was reading Sean's boat, I was so appalled by the notion that he had, you know, electric winch. I, I gave him a really favorable weighting. Um, so, I mean, it's it, like I say, it's kind of, it's kind of arbitrary. We don't count stuff that really makes your boat go fast. Like we don't count, you know, if you've got a Balto plate bottom, that's, you know, polished out to 6,000 grit or you get brand new sails every year, or, you know, you've taken off every last ounce. We don't weigh the boats, you know? So it's just kind of a real rough starting point. I Oddly interject enough, something here real quick, Vince. Yeah, please. I think, see, cause Vince is like, you know, Vince is a pretty serious racer and, uh, and he sails a particular kind of boat. Uh, there's not another boat exactly like Vince's. So there are two kinds of racing really. There's, handicap racing and then there's one design racing one design racing is when all the boats are exactly the same the, the sails are all the same and that's not really what multi-hulls typically do because really there just aren't that many production multi-hulls out there so what vince is talking about uh is uh, a handicap yes. bhrf racing now yeah. yeah thank you for that jeff um anybody got any questions about the rating part of this I, it was my understanding that over time, those uh, ratings are adjusted for performance in races. We do have the ability to do that. A lot of times, um, you know, there's two processes for one of that. One is that we'll give what's called a T rating, a temporary rating. And that makes it really easy to adjust for observed performance. Um, and then um, also people can, you know, challenge rating. 
and say, hey, you rated me too low or too high. And then you bring in evidence to try to convince people that, yeah, this rating is terrible. Pat, uh, I want to ask Pat McGarry, who's on the line here. Pat, have we ever had a rating challenge in the multi-health league? Oh, yeah, several times. Uh, and uh, usually they were adjusted. Uh, usually by the time someone has raced enough that uh, they realize they're either winning all the time, although they would not contest that usually. But if they're losing all the time and they felt like they were sailing the boat to the best of its ability, then uh, yes, yes, they did quite often, not quite often, but occasionally someone would come in and say, look, we these were average conditions. We sailed the boat well. We did this and this is how we did. And uh, so, yeah, there were a few adjustments made and uh, and rightfully so. But like Vince says, it's multi holes are very, very difficult. Uh, there's such a complexity of design and everything else that it's um, you almost have to kind of line them all up on a board and uh, see where that boat fits uh, in between where and and then uh, being a P ex PRHF multi hull raider, you have to look at it from the perspective that let's see how they do. And I'm sure Vince is probably putting a lot of T ratings on new boats that are that are uh, rated because it's easier for him then to go back and re uh, readjust the rating rather than once it's given a permanent number without a T, then it's a little more of a, uh, it has to go through PHRF and it's a little more involved. So uh, typically you'll see some of the, uh, you know, an F31 or something like that, they're fairly easy. Uh, but when you get into the one designs and stuff, you have to give them a T rating for a while and just see how it, see how it goes. Could I yeah. say something uh, regarding rating? Um, Please. Yeah. I'm Craig Garrison. I'm a, I'm a guest here just watching you guys. Um, PHRF on the East Coast is making an attempt to resolve the issue about sport boats because sport boats like Melga's and other, other, bow, other sprit boats have the same kind of problem about fair ratings. And there are apparently some real discussions going on about giving, uh, uh, giving rating adjustments based on other factors that are performance factors might be worth looking into if, if there's uh, if there's questions about it. I'm sure Patrick, you've got some experience with or with it and maybe Vince, uh, Vincent as well, I would assume, but uh, we we're fighting that battle here in Portland, um, trying to get sprit boats, especially Melga's properly rated. Well, it's, it's the same as Vince well knows, it's the same issue with multi hulls when you want to compete against a mono hull it's the same issue that the sports boats are having. Uh, right. They get up on a plane, and it's a whole different, whole different animal when a hull gets up on a plane on top of the water uh, versus a displacement boat. And uh, the it's very, very difficult to come up with a system that is is um, reasonable, and it's uh, it's very difficult. Uh, and uh, anyway, so it, yeah. It, it's a complex issue and uh, sport boats, like I say, are in the same issue that multi hulls are in and that they, they get up on top of the water and they're very lightweight and uh, uh, it, it's a very difficult thing. I'd like to ask, um, hey, Martin, are you there? Yeah. Martin um, was uh, also a, a raider in the past. I think he was in my meet. No, his pet was the prior raider. So Martin, would you like to comment for a moment on the ratings thing and especially you know, I, I know a lot of when I first started racing, I kind of thought, well, shit, they ought to let me race against all these monohulls, you know, because there aren't that many multis. I'd kind of like some recognition if I actually, you know, was lucky enough to win a race. Um, well, the, there are you know, two giving things. up on that. But what, what do you think about all that? There are two things that uh, come to mind. The monohull classes are usually broken into uh, 10 rating points spread per class. multi holes race in a single class that spans over 200 points. It's pretty hard to address all of the variables, especially when, in my opinion anyway, some of the most significant ones aren't addressed in the beginning and then we're supposed to come up with a rating number that people are supposed to be happy with. 
on the large part, on the, on the whole, I didn't hear a huge number of complaints. I mean, yeah, over a glass of beer at the end of a race, nobody's rating was right. And a number of people made a point of bitching about it. And after one of the, uh, well, after one of the Cow Bay regattas, uh, Mike Wright took every single multi-hole finishing time and computed what their rating would have to be for them to place in the top, is either top three or top five. And when somebody came up and complained about it, about their particular rating, we said, okay, if you wanted to place in the top five, instead of being rated at zero, you'd have to be rated at 90. Do you want that 90 rating? And they all kind of swallowed a little bit and said, well, maybe not. There are, if you're talking a pure windward lured race, that's one thing. The rating calculations going back several decades were based on a theoretical average race course with X amount of time upwind versus X amount of time downwind. And some of the sophisticated ones even factored in a little bit of crosswind. And we all knew, or at least I knew, that regardless of what formula you tried to pick, and this addresses your comment, Vince, that you know it's very unscientific. Uh, regardless of what particular formula you decided to pick for a given race, it probably was not going to be the formula that I actually applied to the race course in question. Then you factor in whether you're racing in an average of eight knots of wind or whether you're uh, racing in an average of 15 knots of wind or to make it really fun when you're racing in an average of 20 knots of wind, the performance characteristics of a given multi-hull differs dramatically for each of those wind speeds. So those things are, are for the large part, mitigated in the monohulls because they have an, a, not a true upper limit, but they have more of an upper limit because of hull speed than the multi-hulls do. Multi-hulls do have a hull speed. It's just figured with a very different formula than the, the standard one that's applied to a displacement boat. Um, the, the telling point to me was that I've been involved with racing now for, I don't know, 20 years. Uh, the number of multi-hulls that were uh, racing against each other that had really serious uh, problems were very few. That's not to say they didn't exist. I think that the multi-hull racers were on a large part incredible sportsmen and the majority of them were definitely out there to have a hell of a good time. Um, I think we did. I remember a long time ago, I asked Pat McGarry, because I was struggling with some comments, uh, criticisms about Dragonfly's rating. And uh, sorry, Pat, there were some people who thought you were rated too, too slow, so or too <laughs> fast, whatever. And, and I asked Pat, you know, you know the boat, you know the parameters, you know the, 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 the magic that goes into these crazy things. Where do you think you should rating, your rating should be? And he looked at me and smiled and he says, wherever you put it. <laughs> Good on you, Pat. And I have a picture. That's the best of, answer that I could ever ask for. Yeah, and to illustrate that the problem, uh, Dragonfly is not as fast in light air as a trimaran. And I have a picture of us, which I put up on my bulletin board, Pat, of us, you know, even with Dragonfly partway through a Swiftsure, which is one of my proudest achievements ever. And, you know, because 
dragon, you know, dragonfly is not that much faster than an F-31 in, in really light air in ghosting conditions. So, you know, like he says, it's totally dependent. And, you know, my attitude after a while of doing this was I just picked certain boats that I wanted to be. Like, so when I was doing CYC uh, Wednesday nights, we would try to beat, uh, what the hell was it? There was a FAR 395. Johnny, what the, what's the name of that boat? Um, it was a gray hull. And then we would try to be the FAR, the FAR 30s. You know, there's... Tachyon. Tachyon, right. And when we were doing the, the distance races, we'd always be chasing after uh, um, Carl Buchan's boat. Um, Madrona, you know, we knew that if we were even with Madrona, we were doing all right. You know, we were chasing Madrona, we were doing all right. And we got a tremendous amount of pleasure out of that. But of course we weren't rated with them. We couldn't beat them. They were not even in the same class. So you got to take a different attitude. I think if you want to enjoy the racing, uh, given the, a large amount of arbitrariness in the rating game. I think, I mean, in my, uh, it seems to me that, uh, you know, PRHRF is uh, more of a compromise. I mean, there have been attempts in the past to do ratings where there's kind of, you know, a fluctuating rating depending on conditions and you had a bunch of reporting to do and you had to like keep track of wind speeds and, you know, all this other stuff. And, and, you know, really that's just too much. So, I mean, you know, to me, PHRF really is just a, it's like a, you know, just a big fat rule of thumb. And like Vince said, you know, you just kind of uh, morph your attitude to uh, kind of match that and go out and have fun. Yeah. The other thing to remember is that a rating is not determined by a given race. The rating is performance, uh, observed performance, is a function of the performance of that boat over a whole host of cross sections of of uh, uh, of races. The the rating is fixed. It's the stake in the water that you're measuring and things against. By averaging a large number of races in a large number of venues under a large number of conditions, you start seeing some trends. And if you see, like Pat said, you know. Uh, if you see boats that are consistently finishing ahead of everyone else uh, across all of those factors, then it'd probably be a good idea to take a real hard look and see what you can do about uh, strengthening the handicap on that particular boat. I mean, the whole idea is that these boats are supposed to be rated in such a way that a boat prepared in the upper 10%, crewed by the upper 10%, should be able to sail to a given rating. And that's something that so many racers don't, don't factor it into in their own head. It's not, well, you know, shoot, I, I cleaned the bottom of my boat about three years ago and, and you know, my sails, well, yeah, no problem. Uh, Gosh, I did a perfect spinnaker takedown. Of course, the kids were playing in the sail part of the time, but uh, you know, these are all things that, that, that happen in the real world, but they're not things that the boat is supposed to be rated against. You're assuming that that boat is properly prepared. When Jude Stoller used to compete in Makika, uh, there was no boat on Puget Sound maybe with the exception of Dragonfly, that was pre prepared as carefully. I mean, good grief. Every, every day before a race, he would go down and he'd swim under the boat and he'd carefully scrub the bottom. And he had the boat dialed in for the particular type of sailing that he wanted to do. And it was very unconventional as far as the way an F-25C was rigged. And if you looked at his performance record, you really couldn't criticize that he was doing something that was really right. You know, it's a similar thing with uh, Eric Pesty sails an F-24 out of uh, Victoria. Yeah. <laughs> and that guy, <laughs> that guy, you know, you, you might say he wins a lot of races, 
But after having sailed against him, you're like, he can win the races sailing single handed, you know, in a short course. He's an amazing sailor. And you just see that happen. And so you're like, no, you know, that's top 10%. That's top 1%, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Rating change. Yeah. Let's yeah, let's I leave think... uh, let's leave ratings for a moment. Uh, it's a wonderful. I'd like, make, I'm gonna, I'd like to make one last comment. One thing. Hello. Oh, um, yeah, go ahead. The, nobody's talked about time on distance versus time on time. <laughs> and as an engineer, you know, given that we're really comparing on a percentage basis, time on time would be much better way to do it versus time on distance. I mean, that's just my thought as an engineer. <laughs> well, there's a problem that's involved there. When the ratings were originally started for multi-hulls, the calculations that were used were time on time, and they came up with a number. And then, lo and behold, Puget Sound raced predominantly time on distance. So those time on time ratings were converted to time on distance with a conversion factor. Mm. And I'm not sure, but they may have been changed back and forth. <coughs> well, every time you you nest around with the equations, you change them slightly. And that's one of the reasons that our PHRF Northwest multi-hole ratings are different than just about anywhere else in the country, possibly in the world. It's not that we have everything all screwed up, it's just that we started so darn long ago that we have evolved the numbers with the available data that we had to force a number, a rating number that seemed to be equitable. I don't know, I probably said all that wrong, but uh, hopefully somebody has the idea of what I'm trying to say. You know, it, it is it is weird, I gotta say, that our numbers are so different than um, New England multi Health Association or Chesapeake Bay or um, Bay Area. I mean, that kind of creeps me out. And every now and again, I think, you know what, we ought to just scrap all our numbers and then just use NEMA or BAMA um, and kind of start over. I, but then I, I sort of think about the amount of work that would be involved, and I say, nah, never mind. But Vince, oh. you got to you got to remember that uh, the conditions that they sail in the Bay Area are very consistent. Yeah. yeah. The same with Southern California and some of these other areas. Very consistent. They can depend the wind is going to be in this range, and so the performance is consistent. And like the sport boats they do faster than the displacement boats and it. You know, all these things play into it and it's easier mm. to rate a boat that's going to be sailed in the same conditions all the time versus a Northwest where one day it's going to, one race is going to be dead calm and the next one is going to be blowing 35. So it's, mm. it's, it's a challenge. Yeah. All right. I'd like to go I to think... another unpleasant subject here. Um, which is uh, the safety equipment rules. <laughs> Sean, why are you why why are you raising your your thumb? I think that's a good idea. Oh, I see. Okay. Um, so uh, every time you do a race, in theory, you got to go check and look at the notice of race, which tells you how this is going to work, and you got to check and see which of the multiple safety equipment regulations. Uh, that are currently in effect uh, are to be complied with for that particular race. And there are at least two right now, and there are multiple categories in each two. So there's near shore, and then there's uh, coastal, and then there's offshore, and then there's um, world sailing, and then uh, what's the other one, the, the uh, international sailing thing. And they all differ slightly. And then each organizing authority has the ability to vary the requirements and say, yeah, no, yeah, it's going to be, you know, world sailing near shore, but we want you to do X, Y, and Z. Or it's 
you know, so and so coastal, but you know what, you don't have to do X, Y, or Z. So it's kind of annoying um, to deal with. I just went back and kind of started looking through the current versions of the safety equipment regulations for a couple of races that I like to do, like um, the, uh, you know, the Sloop Tavern race to the Straits or the uh, CYC. Well, there's two different, two different requirements. And I noticed that there are a number of new requirements and I, that like I'm looking at saying, oh, shit, I didn't, I didn't realize that. Like, for instance, um, uh, for one of the coastal ones now, you have to have uh, personal locator beacons, which Sean already has. Good for you, Sean, but nobody else has. Um, but uh, something, oh, I got to look at that. And then there are a number of other things. So safety equipment regulations are something I think we should probably have another topic, have a meeting where we actually go through how we can best meet these safety regulations and whether with respect to some of them, perhaps we ought to try to get them changed. To give you an idea about what that might involve, I, I noticed that, um, you know, they, uh, they still require masthead uh, antennas. Well, we got the Swiftsure regulation changed a number of years ago so that we didn't have to have masthead VHF. We could have it on the stern because with a rotating mast, you know, a masthead antenna is much more vulnerable because you got to have that wire coming out and rotating around. We thought it'd be better to allow people to put it on their stern rail. Um, same thing for uh, life jackets. If you're wearing a, you know, a dry suit, which everybody on my boat for Swiftsure would have to wear a dry suit, wearing a 33 pound PFD inflatable is just making life more dangerous. So last Swiftsure I did, I had I carried with me those stupid West Marine 33 pound PFDs in a big damn bag. And then we all wore our dry suits and kayak vests. So there's a, you know, there's a bunch of discussion that needs to be had about what's really safe. How do you comply to the best of your ability? And you know, some of this shit you're just not gonna comply with probably. The problem so, you have is Vince, you should explain why you wore the lighter vest, because that's very important with multi -oats. Well, why don't you speak to that, uh, Pat, because you have the actual experience that says <laughs> why you should wear the lighter vest. I can speak to it lividly, but no. Um, you wear a, a dry suit and a 33-pound flotation vest, and you go up and your boat goes over, and you're trapped underneath a trampoline. I dare you to try to swim down and get from out from underneath that. Very, very difficult. So that's why we've been pushing and pushing, like in the Swiftsure has separate multi-hull safety regulations, but we've been pushing for that because you just can't get out from underneath a trampoline with that much flotation. So uh, that's yeah. the reason for it. Yeah, and escape yeah. hatches and escape hatches are another, especially on the trimarans, very very important. Uh, you have to have them. Well, and we don't. Oh, you know. real quick here, Vince. If I could just before we scare off all the people who are thinking about racing, but you know, and, and they're hearing about you know rules and regs and PRTF ratings and things like that. I mean, you know, racing is a little bit, you know, like many things, right? There are different levels, and so when Vince is talking about you know, the regs and, and, uh, you know, we're talking about flipping your boat over and swimming out from underneath the net. I mean, you know, there are various levels of risk, right. And, in, in different intensities of races. So what Vince is talking about is, you know, offshore race or whatever. And, you know, there are other introductory races around where the rules are not quite as rigid and the requirements are not quite as rigid, rigid, um, so for instance, you know, if you're trying to uh, get into racing for the first time, you just want to try it out. You really don't know what you're doing. You may not even know the, you know, all the rules, you know, there's some races around Puget Sound that are geared for that. Like in the summer, you know, there's a thing called take your time Fridays, which, you know, you can do out of shul shul when, you know, it's, you know, kind of a low key thing. I, I wouldn't recommend anyone doing necessarily duck dodge 
on a multi-hull because you know there's not much room on the lake and there are too, probably too many boats to it's just kind of easy to get yourself into you know striking range of other other vessels but but uh you know my 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 point is, is that when you're starting out pick your race i mean nobody is going to uh, think that you going out if you've never raced before and and you know you do swisher that's just not a good idea so you kind of like many things you just kind of work up to this stuff yeah i want to address excuse me guns i want to address the uh, pfd issue just briefly because uh sue and i just completed the online part of the safety at sea uh class and my previous view after uh, reviewing the events with Dragonfly and Pat McGarry's experience was to convert my uh, manual, or excuse me, my automatic inflatables to manual, which I did. Uh, but at least on my boat, while well, both situations are unlikely, uh, the response to the gas reflex convinced me to. to uh, to go back to an automatic inflatable. Um, our boat's unlikely to capsize. If it does, it's going to float stern down a little bit, and we probably would not be trapped underneath the tramp. Uh, not to understate the, I, I don't want to diminish the advice that that Pat McGarry's capsize uh, led me to think about manual inflation but it's probably something to consider for different types of boats perhaps we're going back to uh the automatic inflatables yeah i i really do think uh it would be good for us to have a kind of line by line review in one of our meetings um about how to comply um and you know, what, what, what are cost effective ways? I mean, this gets expensive for the bigger races. I think um, Jeff's point about do the low key races, you know, like, and we're going to talk about which races to do in a minute here, but I, I think that's a, a really good point. So yeah, let's, let's uh, go on from the safety equipment requirements and talk about where to race. And let's divide this into kind of categories. Um, of types of races, where you might find some other multis to race with. And this, I think, also goes to our joint discussion here about what races would you like to do? Um, you know, um, and let's start with the, the kind of um, the lowest key, the, the weeknight races, Wednesday night, Friday night, Monday night, whatever it is. Um, I have to say, I've found those over the years to be just an incredibly important part of getting to be a better sailor and also just creating joy in your week, week to week life through the summer. I can't tell you how great it felt through these long Seattle summers to, you know, ride down to the Marina and just go out sailing for a couple hours. Um, and it, the stakes are so low. And a lot of times we'd be the only boat in our class. We'd be the multi hull boat, man. We'd just start last, no stress on the starting line, and see if we could, uh, you know, catch people just for the hell of it, you know? And sometimes we would catch them all and finish in front of all of them if the conditions are just right. And you know, like, we felt like we won. Uh, so wherever you are, check, do the, do the Monday night race if you can, or the Wednesday night, or the Friday night, or whatever. In Seattle, I like the Sloop Tavern race. I think they, they've probably got right now the best attendance of uh i think cyc is falling way off and they're more expensive any comments on the the weeknight stuff hey vince i got a i got a question about that so i'm like the one percenter here that has probably the, the highest number rating boat in the world being like 216 <laughs> massive um <laughs> what is the likelihood of me th throwing me into a different class? Because honestly, I'd be really competitive against T-Birds. And that to me would be really fun to race against a T-Bird. But anytime yeah. I try to register for anything, it always throws me into a multi-hole class, which I'm like, 
okay, so they're going to finish. I'm going to start last and never see another person and get lapped like four times. Yeah, no, it's terrible. Um, it's okay, Dan. We'll be right there with you. <laughs> I, I'd like to ask Pat and uh, Martin to address that. Uh, you got, you know, a lot of history with that 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 profound reluctance on the part of the organizing authorities to let us race with the other boats you know should we try to make another go at this it just uh again it gets back to that same issue they're having with the mul with the monohulls and uh martin can weigh in on it but uh you know they they're totally different characteristics between a multi-hull and a monohull and the, the ratings are based on the characteristics and it's very, very difficult to do. I mean, uh, you know, the, the weird thing is, you know, that um, what's, uh, you know, the, the, the boat we're talking about, Dan's boat, it's a, um, how is it, Dan, again? It's a, a brown 25. Exactly. Um, I mean, it really is. It's a it's a brown twenty five that needs a diet, right? It's the it's the most the most elaborately equipped brown. It has an anchor windlass. <laughs> you okay, Pat? You looked like you had a stroke there for a minute. <laughs> Man, is that a, a, a little Sea Runner twenty five? Exactly, it's a Sea Runner twenty five. Yeah, it has it has every piece of heavy one inch stainless you could possibly bolt onto it, and uh, all the other girthy options. Dan, there is no reason whatsoever that you can't race with the uh, Thunderbirds. Just don't expect to get rated with them, and expect <laughs> to show up on the podium with them. No, no, uh, but, the, but the ratings the ratings very similar, so it, it just it, adds it, a level of competitiveness to have that same start with them is the more important thing. You know, if it's if it's only I would like you to let me start with the Thunderbirds, and you've been racing up at CYC Edmonds, for instance, and you can show that hey, look, I've been in three races, and my finishing time is right on on par with the Thunderbirds. Um, you know, maybe that would work. I don't know. Yeah. I Entirely possible that it would. Uh, they're, they're open to it up there. To, I was, I was to be on the close for sort of beer can races. Yeah, Jim it's going to have to be at the individual level. Tavern's it's pretty it's open. not something that's going to be institutionalized, I, I don't believe. Uh, I was watching YouTube the other day, and there was a person that was launching, I don't know, this gargantuous great big powerboat, three axle trailer, it had a pickup truck got out of the pickup truck and the pickup truck started going down the ramp in reverse with nobody in it. And the driver jumped into the doorway and pushed with all his might against the door jam. And by God, he could not stop the momentum of that boat. And that's a little <laughs> bit like what racing classes are on Puget Sound. There's a huge <laughs> amount of momentum that's, that's developed over the years. I'm not saying don't do it. I'm just saying you're going to have to do it on an individual level. I think that you probably have a real good idea. Talk to the guys and the, the other T-Bird sailors. See if you can get somebody to advocate with you. I, I like that you're like putting me in the same class as the guy going down the ramp with a loose chair. Nobody, nobody from, <laughs> with authority is going to put you in the Thunderbird class Yeah, that I know of. Well, yeah, see it, what is, said, it see is what interesting. It was actually quite open to it, and that's kind of why I joined up there. But it's a long haul coming out the locks and then going up there on a weekend to, to hit a race. You should talk to Sloop Tavern, man. Uh, they might do it. So, so again, I think you know, the big deal is the difference in the types of the boats and you know, kind of like Pat was talking about, or I think a couple of people were talking about it. I mean, so your boat may have the kind of same, you know, range of speeds and different wind strengths as some other boats. And, you know, frankly, what you're talking about is exactly the way PHRF and starts work for monohulls, right? They group everybody by a PR, PRHF range. So everybody from X to X starts the same. Everybody from X to X is, starts the same. So, but, uh, you know, one thing that I think, and this is, this is my own personal opinion here. I mean, you know, try and do what you can, change the rules, try and, try and get your, you know, work with PHRF rating, you know, do whatever you want. 
But the overarching goal, I think, you know, for you being out there is in because I think the returns of, you know, winning are far less than the returns that you get from being out there and the things that you learn about sailing and the skills that you gain while you while you are racing, that really in the end it doesn't matter. I mean, you can uh, you know, great. So you have a shelf and it's got a bunch of stuff on it that, you know, and maybe that makes you feel good and that's great. But, um, you know, to me, that is like a very minimal kind of thing. I mean, I didn't, if I really wanted to compare myself skill on skill to sailors, I would do one design. I'd get a dinghy, I, which I, you know, so you sail against Carl Buchan, you sail against the McKees, you sail everybody against everybody in the CL area that, you know, is on the Olympic team, you know, then you really get a sense of, you know, oh yeah, okay, well, am I, am I, am I a winner or am I not a winner? I mean, that's, to, you know, that's to me, that's, that should really be in the, in the, in the, you know, distant reaches of your mind. I mean, you know, when you go out there to do a race, the benefits are that number one, you're getting out there more. Number two, you're sailing in very close, you know, situations with other boats. You have to learn how to handle your boat. You obviously don't want to hit anyone. And the other thing is you're going to be out there in different conditions. I mean, it's different than cruising. You know, when you're cruising, you get to go out there and you pick your day, you pick your weather, you know, et cetera, like that. So you never really what to do. You never really learn what to do in an emergency. So, you know, so to speak, I mean, if you're racing, you're out there racing, and then you get to really start making those hard calls or the calls, you know, about, well, okay, do I really continue or, you know, can I improve my skills? Can I actually sail in this? You know, and you, you know, you learn quite a bit more. So uh, that's my That was statement. good, Jeff. That was good, <laughs> man. Um, I'd like to, to change from weekday racing, which is the easiest stuff, and you could race against the Thunderbirds, to the pinnacle races of um, the Puget Sound region, the, the, the big ones, the ones that have the biggest requirements, where the toughest competition, where there's the most people. And I think at the top of that list probably is Swiftsure. Uh, and I'd like John Green to talk about that because John um, was a uh, Commodore at Royal Vic, I believe, and in 2018 had the most multi-hells on the line ever for a race to Clallam Bay. Um, John, would you like to talk about, you know, your experience in doing Swiftsure, and you've done it a couple of times double-handed, which is impressive, um, and the preparation that that requires, and uh, what's what's on what you think might happen this year? Are we going to see Swiftsure? You're muted, John. There we are. <laughs> I was I got into a total panic there because I couldn't unmute myself. <laughs> to, yeah, thanks. Uh, uh, Vince called me earlier today, it was twelve or one o'clock or so, and he asked me about Swiftsure, and I wasn't uh, sure. Uh, what was happening this year, and uh, but I said they were going to try and put the nose race up by February the 1st, and if you look now, six hours later, it's up. <laughs> it's, um, I, I got a hold of the, uh, uh, one of the co-chairs, and it went up about maybe four or five this afternoon, but um, there's still some provisos on it, because registration is not going to be open until the 1st of March, which is another month from now, and that's because of the questions you're all talking about, and that's what COVID regulations are going to be in Canada. As I understand right now, everybody, oh, let me back up a little bit there. For all of Swiftsure, 55 to 60% of our entrants are traditionally from Puget Sound. And so we depend 45% on Canada and 55% or so on you guys to fill it up. And if Americans can't come up here, we're down to a really small race. It's not going to be Swiftsure. So... Currently, to come into this country, I think you have to have a valid, uh, uh, what we call a passport, uh, proof, of, uh, proof of vaccination. Right now, we're talking in Canada about being triple vaxxed. I don't know what it's like down in the States. But with that, you have to have a PCR test, which is the expensive one, not the rapid test. You have to have a PCR test before you come up. And then if you're here for more than 72 hours, the Americans want you to have one before you go back as well. And those could be costing oh, 250 bucks each way, I think. I, I don't know what they cost down there, but they're pretty expensive up here. And so for a boat, say 10 people, uh, that'd be 10 times 250 times two. That's you're looking at five grand 
of PCR testing for people that come up here. And uh, for smaller boats like ours, we usually go two or three and, uh, and it would be much, much less. So until March the 1st, we're not gonna open registration in case we have to cancel the race a month later, because then there's the problem of everybody having paid their money, then we have to go and pay everybody back their money. And there's a lot of, uh, a lot of work to be doing all that. Um, so I haven't actually read the notice of race yet because I only got home a little while ago, but uh, traditionally we've always done the Cape Flattery race. And as Vince mentioned, the funnest race I ever did was the Clala Bay race. I've done, I've done a total of 19 Swiftures on my boat. I know a few of you people on here. I know Pat McGarry really well because we've, he's partied at my house and he's taught me so much stuff in the back. And, uh, and I think he and I helped put together a lot of the safety regulations, maybe 10 or 15 or so years ago. But, uh, but uh, the Clallam Bay race I found was a heck of a lot of fun. And otherwise, we've done mostly the uh, Cape Flattery race, which is always an overnight race, not for not for somebody going 25 steady, but for most of us going 10 or 12, it's an overnight race. Um, the 19 races that I've done, for those of you who don't know me, my boat's a Farrier uh, F9AX, it's the wide-bodied uh, F9A, and uh, it's a I, I kind of like it. It's a pretty little boat and we have gone fast and we have gone slow. Uh, I've hit every kind of weather, every, I haven't used every kind of safety gear, but I know stuff that I should have had. I don't have, uh, what do you call it, a safety hatch. Uh, what I do have as an inverted compartment that when the boat's upside down, if it ever was, I can get into. And I do keep a hatchet in there so that if I had to, there's a marked off area in the bottom that I could hatch it my way through it and get into the boat for stuff that I needed. Um, We've had a lot of, uh, Swisher has been just a wonderful thing. And uh, uh, Martin Adams brought something up and he talked about sportsmanship a little while ago. My favorite story about sportsmanship and Pat McGarry was there as well, was running with scissors was coming from Friday Harbor around through Roche Harbor down to Victoria on a Friday night for a Saturday morning at 10 o'clock start. They hit a rock and uh, in Mosquito Pass. And I think the skipper went overboard and they dragged him back on and they came back to Victoria and their dagger board was really, really smashed. And uh, the nicest thing I ever recalled from Swiftsure was every sailor there, I got called. My wife was the Swiftsure coordinator at the time. She got a phone call and said, a damaged boat is coming in. It's a multi-hull. It needs repairs. I had probably no longer finished building my boat than about, well, maybe two years before that, I had a basement full of everything you could possibly need to build a boat, including heat lamps. There were people down there, I think, till at least three o'clock in the morning, cutting that thing down, fairing it, heat lamps, get it hot, put some stuff on, fair it down. And at three o'clock in the morning, they took the boat around to the inner harbor. And at nine o'clock, they were able to get to the start line and they did well. And it was the nicest bit of sportsmanship that I ever recall in any sport that I've ever played. And when uh, Running with Scissors got sold many years later, we still had that one foot shorter dagger board, as far as I know. Isn't that right, Pat? I don't think they ever changed it again after that. And uh, we've had some pretty famous people up here. Y'all y'all know Randy Smythe. And I phoned Randy one time, seeing if he could get California people up here. So he actually came himself, raced on an F-25A called uh, Wild Child and got second on line honors because he came to a race passage and stuck to the shore and everybody else goes outside the great circle route. And he didn't know that. So a bunch of us were able to pass him when he was sitting there. It's nice to beat an Olympian like, <laughs> like Randy Smythe. And, uh, and then of course we had Steve Fawcett come one time and I phoned Steve Fawcett. I was, I was the multi-hall what do you ever call it, an organizer or whatever, push man. I got a hold of Steve Fawcett and told him about Swiftsure because Randy Smythe had said, if you want him to come, just tell him there's a record to break because he likes breaking records. And uh, when I got him, he was in a balloon doing a certain navigation and he was above India. And he texted me back from India and said, I'll have a look at it. And a month later, <laughs> he, I, we got a letter and said, oh, Steve Fawcett with a boat called USA is coming up here. You ever heard of that boat? And, and when he got here, I said, oh, I, I phoned you. You were above India. And he said, yeah, I got her. I texted you back. <laughs> it was really cool. But uh, I, I don't know what else I've got to say about Swiftsure this year, except we want it to be on. But personally, I'm not... I. I'm kind of skeptical because I don't see by February the 28th, which is 
four weeks from today, I don't see things getting a heck of a lot better than they are right now. But we're going to try and make a call at that time. In the meantime, the notice of race is there. And I've Oh, Vince asked me about the double handing stuff. Yeah, we've done a lot of swift shares, but most of the time, my wife and I, Marg and I, we sail alone because uh, because we're getting older and we don't have friends that want to come with us anymore. But uh, we have done quite a number of swift shares, at least three or four, just the two of us. Normally, it's about three or four guys, but a few times I said, Marg, I can't get anybody. So she puts on her stuff and we go out there and we've always done relatively well. And one year, about seven or eight years ago, we actually won the race. <laughs> we, and we were double-handed and everybody else was fully crewed. So we felt good about that. And that was one of those light wind drifter races. Part of the reason Margaret and I won is we never quit. And we actually made it through race passage on a real good flood. And once we got through the flood about, it was still daylight, uh, but 40 hours only after we started. And, uh, and uh, it was it was just a, the most incredible thing finishing at one o'clock in the morning. It took us from sunset till one o'clock in the morning to get from race passage of the inner harbor. That's averaging about one and a half knots. So that was that <laughs> was brutal. That one. And we've done the exact opposite. We've gone through race passage with uh, too much sail up, as I know many of us have done. And uh, we hit a standing wave with stupid spinnaker and a full main up could never ever have been there. I got seven stitches down my chin and my wife got a concussion falling backwards into the boat, hitting her head on the, on the uh, dagger board case. And, but we came out, the two of us got that stupid. I thought we we're going to have to cut the lines and let it go, but we actually got it back on and used it the next day. So that's pretty cool. Yeah. So I'm happy to ask, not ask, <laughs> answer any questions about Swiftsure or my boat or, that kind of stuff. I prefer the long distance stuff. I don't like round the boys racing very much. I do a little bit of it, but not much. If there's distant races in our club, I'll, I'll do those things. But uh, but I'm I'm here for a while. If you have questions about Swiftsure, past, present, or future, I'm certainly give it a shot. But what is your favorite thing about Swiftsure? Like do you have one, you know, like one particular moment or something that you like about Swiftsure? Oh, my favorite moment ever was my son who was, uh, he had moved away to Australia and he was back and there were four of us on the boat and the wind was just ideal. And we were sailing on windward out towards uh, 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 Nia Bay and uh, the swell was just incredible. It was just beautiful. You could sit, not see a thing. Then to the top of the waves, you could look out and you could see the flashing orange light over there at Nia Bay and you could see all of the stuff. And the moon was so bright, I could have read a novel in the cockpit. And there were just the two of us up. Now, my son, many, many years ago, when he was 10 years old, we sailed off to Mexico and Hawaii with him. And he was doing night watches all alone at age 10. And he got to be really good at trimming sails. And he did a bit of racing and stuff like that. And I remember that just the two of us were out there and we were on a, um, I think we were in starboard. No, we were in port and we were going basically due west. And uh, I said, well, we better go to Nia. No, he said, no, I said, we, we got to go now to Nia Bay. He said, no. And I said, well, you call it. And about 10 minutes later, he called it. We went to the mark on one tack and that little bugger who hadn't sailed for about 10 years, called the tack perfectly on me and we rounded Nia Bay and then uh, shoot up and, and a beautiful ride back home. And the swells were just so gorgeous. Another really funny thing that happened was in the early, early days of this, uh, when we started putting orange lights on the top of the Clala Bay and Nia Bay uh, thing, because there's orange lights, people don't have orange lights. They have red, they have green, all that kind of stuff. But everybody was told at Clala Bay, look for the flashing orange light. And uh, that's what you aim for. Well, there's a bunch of guys aiming for a flashing orange light and the light seemed to be moving, but they all kept on converging, going more west and more west. And then on the radio, there was the orange light was on the top of the Coning Tower of an American submarine going out to sea. And apparently they use a flashing orange light. And there was about <laughs> 20 sailboats <laughs> aiming towards this flashing orange light <laughs> on collision course with the submarine. <laughs> that was really pretty funny. But yeah, uh, yeah. Oh, there's been lots of funny things like that. Uh, 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 one of our rounding boats caught about a 40 pound halibut. They fed all the sailors halibut. As you're going around and oh that was really that was really good but yeah go ahead ask anything i've i've been there for 19 or 20 of them and i was on the steering committee for over 20 years so i've, I've been around a bit on this race uh, uh, for for someone who's a first timer what uh you have any advice for someone who wants to do it for the first time so they got a boat they want to sign up 
Um, you have to have overnight experience. I, that's one of our prerequisites. I believe it is anyway, it should be. Uh, I have all your safety gear on board. Um, my first one, um, I cannot even remember, it was so long ago. Uh, just follow the rules. If you're not sure of yourself, back off. If, you, if you've got four crew and two are seasick and you're gonna be alone, Victoria is a nice town to come back to and have a dinner and a beer. Uh, get there early. Try not to rush to the start line. Uh, take a lot of time. Uh, John Green. If you're not sure of yourself, don't try and go in close quarters. Don't leave out people. You know, give others lots of room. Stay away from the slow monohull. We always used to do that. We uh, we used to start the multis last, and then we changed to start them uh, second from the front because it was just too much hassle having about 15 multi-hulls weaving their way through about uh, 150 uh, monohulls. So they ended up starting us. We changed it. I think I was involved in that change to make a second start after the Long Swiftshire boats. But uh, as far as first time around, just take it easy. Don't panic. Don't worry if you're not first and uh, don't take chances. So John, if we're doing it uh, this year, would the multis go to Clallam Bay or Nia Bay? I'm going to have to if I have any input into it, I don't have any input because I'm off the committee totally right now. But if they ask me, I would suggest, I would suggest uh, the very last year we did at Vince, we had Nia and Clallam as two. And I got pilloried for putting in that Clallam Bay race. And it turned out to be the best race we had. And we still had six or seven boats going to Nia Bay, but we had double digit boats going to Clallam Bay. And it was so nice. You, you were home before dark that night, weren't you? Yeah. Yeah. And we were heard just at dusk. We were, uh, I, I had some pretty not well crew. They were not well. <laughs> so we didn't do well in that race. But I love the fact that it, getting home before dark was so nice to do a 70 something mile race and still get home early. So if they ask me, I'll suggest that that was our best race. John, it might be worth mentioning too that uh, Swiftsure is the only race that your boat will be inspected for its safety gear. Exactly. I didn't even mention that, Pat, but uh, when you finish the race, they don't inspect you before the race. They, you have to sign off a tick sheet. I've got tick, 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 tick. I've got all these things and you keep it on the boat or when you hand in your thing. You, you... However, when you get to the end, somebody's going to come on your boat and say, well, let me see your two anchors. Oh, you only have one anchor. Bang. There goes your gold medal, and uh, they and it'd be random. They might ask about a VHF. They might ask about a hand bearing compass. They might ask about life jackets, all that sort of stuff. So when you get off the boat, make sure you got a survival suit and a life jacket on, and won't ask any more questions. Yeah, not they, to uh, interrupt too much. But that? I think the Pacific Northwest Offshore also has an inspector. Do they? Okay, they followed our example, I guess. That would be me. Okay, <laughs> there you go, Craig. <laughs> Good. But, yeah, I uh, think Swisher Swisher is an example of the of a race that is both very challenging, um, and attracts a big multi hall contingent. So it's something that you really kind of do. I am not a huge fan of sailing at night, um, <clears throat> but it's something that you know you kind of got to do. Yeah. And in the daytime, you see those logs, and in the daytime, you never see them. And yeah, I've never right. hit one at nighttime. I hit one in the daytime. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's that's one of my biggest concerns. You know, if somebody goes overboard oh. at nighttime, man, you know, yeah, that's a nightmare. That, that's right, and uh, uh, that's 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 right. In the fifty some odd, well, Swiftsure has been 70, 75 years of Swiftsure. We've missed the last two. There's been one fatality. Is that, that right? Was, yeah, it was one fatality. Uh, that huh. was 1970 some odd. And it was a guy who uh, fell off and never came back. And that was on a monohull. We didn't have multi-hulls in the race then. The first multi-hulls in the race welcomed were about, let's see, mid-1990s. And John, oh, John Walton and... The guy who is the broker in Seattle, they did it on an F-27. John oh, Walton, of course. Uh, John Walton. John. John. Uh, Carl. Carl, Carl. Yeah. There were two Johns. 
Yeah, big guy. Anyway, and they raced, and I think Wayne Gorey had his boat in, and that was about 1994. And those two boats, mm -hmm. I think, were the first time multi hulls went in the race. And then I got asked to sit on the committee. We got it up to 18 a few years later. We had some fantastic boats in that race. And uh, when we had 18, there was only like 200 boats. And so we were like 10% of the entire fleet. And we were on the front page of the Times Colonist because of these, those multi hulls are crazy is that those kind of comments because they'd be going past Clallam Bay going so fast. So, uh, mm. yeah. Okay. Don't want so, to take up your whole night. No. So let's talk about some of the other races. So, you know, Swiftsure, hopefully this year, hopefully um, the, the other kind of big long race um, I'd like to talk about uh, is um, Van Isle. Uh, there's a race around the San Juan Islands that's an overnight race. Van Isle is a long and difficult race, but it's a stage race, so you don't go overnight. Um, With one know, exception. On the, out, uh, ah, on the right. outside the legs, you don't. On the outside legs, you do. And right. Victoria and Nanaimo is usually overnight. Yeah. Um, that's, the, that's a race I would like to do is Van Isle, but... Um, and then, of course, uh, the uh, R2AK. But that's a different kettle of fish, you know? That's, that's crazy, yeah. That's... I think that R2AK is is in its own category as an adventure race. Yeah. You know? Um, but the, the Van Isle, uh, we've got a number of people who've done the Van Isle here. Uh, anyone, you know, and it's been sort of overshadowed by the R2AK last couple of years. Um, is I that was also canceled that? last year because of COVID? Sure, yeah. that'll be interesting to see if it makes a comeback. Yeah, I think it's 2023. Does can anybody confirm that they're looking at the next Vinyl 360? Yeah, they did it every other year, so that would make it was some the sense. years that the that the uh, Victoria Maui is not on. It's the opposite mm -hmm. year to Vic Maui because a lot it's of the, the, same odd, the odd odd years. Yeah, odd, odd years. Mm -hmm. Odd years. So it's 2023 we're looking at then. And mm -hmm. I have heard about the, I've already seen some uh, stuff about 2023 for Van Al 360. And again, it's a great race. It's just a, it's a fun race. Now, my, personally, my favorite category of races, I'm not, uh, I'm less of a fan of the, of the short course Windward Lourdes, partly because I'm just, you know, it gets tiring and a little bit boring. Um, I like the distance races that are over in a day and we've got some wonderful races like that. And I, I, and we have in other years had reasonable uh, multi-health participation and foremost among those, I think is the CYC Seattle um, series of races in the spring, three races. Um, now, and most recently hasn't been anybody but us, but um if people are interested in, you know, that's a race that's worth traveling to usually. Um, you know, it's usually on a Saturday. Um, but if you can come to that, they're fun races. They'll be, you know, 35, oh, excuse me, uh, 35 miles, something like that, 40 miles. Uh, and you'll finish in the daylight. Are you talking about the Center Sound Series? Uh, that's Center Sound Series, March? exactly. Okay, yeah. 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 yeah, starting in March 5th. Isn't there a race um, to Port Townsend as well? There is. And that's another uh, wonderful race that we've had good multi-health participation. And that's race sponsored by Scoop Tavern. Uh, and that, but that's a double-handed race. And that's oh, part, of the, that. okay. part of the charm of that race. Yeah. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to do that this year. Um, that's, uh, that's, that's Race to the Straits. And actually, in just going back to the ratings thing, it's super fascinating when when you go on it enough times and you're the very last boat or you're with the TP-52s and it's a pursuit race and you end up up there with the same, you, you weave through everybody. If you're doing the right thing, you weave through everybody and you get there and you're one of the top five, six, seven, eight, nine boats and the ratings come, the, obviously how you sail the boat matters, but the ratings really come clear when you get there because you started so far behind so many people so it's pretty fascinating to, to kind of and actually the, the ratings 
uh, as demonstrated by the results aren't that far off, man, you know? Um, like if you do it enough times, you're like, oh, right. We're just right here with these, you know? Yeah, we're, we're not as fast as Jim Thompson, you know? He's fast, say he, he sell that damn F-27 and get there first. Yeah, it's, it's a fascinating and amazing race. So I would, I would say that uh, center sound series is something that we should really kind of focus on and uh, race to the straights. Those are you know, four spring races, March and April, uh, that are really, really a lot of fun. Um, when you get uh, the, the, the race that I most enjoy that's more of a buoy style race is Cowichan Bay, which happens to be in Canada, which is a pain in the ass. <laughs> but, um, and there's nothing on their website, you know, uh, as to whether they would be doing it. Um, 54 remember, 40 or fight. Yeah. <laughs> I remember Martin uh, encouraging me to go to Cowichan Bay and telling me how great a race it is. And I, you know, he was underselling it. it it's just flat water, good wind, sun, you know, and the races are typically not just windward lured, they're kind of these short distance races with legs that are, you know, off the wind here, on the wind there, uh, reach, uh, you know, they're very interesting courses. Um, and sometimes you got a great big old ship anchored in the middle of the course. So that is, and there were, there have been, you know, 14, 15 boats there, uh, multi hulls there. Um, and they will get off two or three races a day, you know, three races on Saturday, two on Sunday, that kind of thing. So you really, that's probably the best time to see how good your, your just straight up sailing skills are. Um, super, super fun race. I hope they do that this year. And, and they have real marks. You cut the mark too close and you just ran into a big rock. <laughs> oh, I don't know anybody who's done that around here. Pat. No, but we've seen what a crab eats when he's uh, close to the mark. <clears throat> no, it, you're right. It is incredible. 9.30, we're sitting down eating breakfast saying, well, they're going to cancel the race today. There isn't a breath of wind. 10 o'clock at the start, and you got 16 knots, 18 knots, and everything is really, really cool. And the start and line is nice and short. You the doctor comes. options on it. The doctor comes in there every every uh, late morning. Yeah, and and because it's it's uh, kind of inside these this this valley, the water's flat, so you get 15 knots of wind and uh, and no waves. You know, you're feeling like a hero. Hey, to the group, while we're talking about various races, I just want to get a plug in for the Pacific Northwest Offshore. We've never had all, we've never had multi hulls, and I know that there's some reluctance about it from the group. But uh, as a a former pretty active multi huller and one that's had a chance to do some offshore racing on larger multi hulls many years ago, um, I'm really interested in seeing if we can get a group of group of you guys to come on down and, and race with us. I was just reading about that the 46 international annuals coming up, uh, but. The thing that's popping in my head is the same uh, complexity as he was talking about with Swiftsure at being a dozen in Victoria. Uh, this year, last year, we didn't. Okay. Uh, we we ended up uh, ending in Port Angeles. Oh, okay. This year, we hope to end up in Victoria, mm -hmm. but we're only going to do that if, uh, if we can do it without um, a, a huge amount of issues. And the issues are very real, and we're taking a constant look at them. I've been in contact with uh, with our VYC Swiftshire committee um, on a particular basis and um, we're we're still looking at it and we're proceeding cautiously but I would like to say that it would make me for whatever it's worth very happy to see some folks get interested in in coming and playing um, yeah. just to, like a fun race yeah just to throw the gauntlet on the ground, the uh, record is 14 hours. That was done by a by a monohull boat called Icon. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of that boat, but uh, but uh, sailed by Kevin Welch and his Olympic crew. But uh, there you have it. But it was a it would have been a wonderful year. That was a year that Rage didn't race, and they've been kicking themselves ever since. But uh, it would have been a fairly good year for 
for a, a, a strong multi-hull group. Um, Does that end up being an upwind race in the summertime? Well, it's we well we we advertise it as uh, three races in one. Um, you go up the coast, and the prevailing breeze is, of course, northwest. Um, last year, the race was started under Spinnaker, and uh, we they held kites for pretty much half the upwind leg, the up the coast leg, and then it turned into a uh, let's see who you, let's see if you can write your name in the straights on the tracker uh, because it got so light. But um, uh, I would say of, I've done 15, and I would say of the 15 I've done, 10 have been upwind uh, races, um, sometimes in the late afternoon, a bit of a slog, but it gets light in the evening. Uh, you generally wake up off of uh, Destruction Island smelling, smelling the wonderful perfume of seals and, uh, and sailing in pretty light air, struggling around. Then you get into the straits, and it's the, it's the same, old, old, same old straits routine. But um, starting in Ilwaco like we do, we change from Victor from Astoria to Victoria uh, to Ilwaco because they had much better accommodations, uh, specifically for the larger boats. Um, every year we were planting rage and some of the deeper draft boats on the ground in Astoria. But Ilwaco really, uh, really welcomed us, and they have a lot more room, bigger slips, et cetera, et cetera. Plus, we had three mermaids last year, so you know how can it get better than that? Um, at any rate, um, I would like to say I would love to see see you guys come, some of you, and I would be the point man for it. And um, I may very well be calling on some of you guys that have the have the experience to um, uh, to help us work out some of the some of the details for for multi hulls. Uh, Joe and Sue Daisy are going to be our communications and and escort boat this year, which is very kind of them. We're really looking forward to that. Uh, they're not going to be officially racing, although I'm guessing the temptation will occur. Um, but um, at least we'll have one multi on our race this year and uh, maybe others. So I appreciate you guys. Let me uh, let me uh, listen in on your on your meeting and uh, would love to talk to you if any of you have any questions either offline or now. So I'm can looking I, at can I say walk. you no, got to no, sail no. out through the you got to sail out through the, the bar. Yeah, correct. Vince, I wanted to excuse uh, me. No, you don't have to sail out through the bar. You have to get out. The starting line is outside of the bar. Yeah. Huh. Yeah. No, I'm sorry. I, that, that's correct. Thanks, Joe, for that. No, we we motor out and sometimes sail out to buoy two. And we start from buoy two. And we always uh, hold the start. The start time is relatively fluid because obviously we don't want to send people out when there's 10 foot breakers going all across the entrance, although that's, uh, that's not happened yet, at least in the races I've done. So, um, yeah, we start at buoy two. And then, then Tatouche is, uh, is a turning mark and off we go. I've got a little anecdote about that race. I think there's a guy called Frank Callistro. Oh, yeah. many many times many times many times and he's a really nice guy and uh one year uh quite a long time ago he ticked the wrong box and entered his boat in the multi-hull race to cape flattery and uh when he got to victoria he had signed up for everything we had for multi-hull including dinner at the empress hotel where we had a bengal curry night and we got to the dinner and we're introducing everybody and he said now frank you're up here in your multi-hull from portland tell me about your boat he said multi-hull what do you mean and he's got like a, a newport 40 or something like that or he's got a, he's <laughs> got a cascade he said, 36 yeah he said it was the most fun race he ever had was getting to victoria and coming to the multi-hull dinner and he said well i got a dinghy that could be two hulls anyway so and then one time somebody got sunk by a whale just outside the bar as i just as i recall yeah, they. Uh, I think it was in 2012 or 13. A breaching uh, whale hit a boat. Um, yeah, it, it didn't sink the boat. No, but it wrecked it. Yeah, I took the rig down and and uh, did some serious damage to it. Yeah, but yeah. Uh, there are pictures. Yeah. <laughs> and if anybody, if any of y'all are curious about the conditions that you see on on the race, if you go to YouTube. And put on put in Icon 2014 Oregon Offshore. Uh, they did a really really cool video that um, 
and mainly as they were going up the coast and it was it was it's a fun it's a fun thing to watch it's it's really great see a bunch of you know experts like those guys really pushing that boat hard and then Greg, i'm doing the pacific northwest offshore this year in a monohull so great what boat uh, uh equilibrium oh yeah great so uh yeah first mate on equilibrium so i'll i'll come back and let the crew think about what's going on out there in the ocean and see if we can't drum some of these people to go. I know Jeff was maybe thinking about it, but his schedule is a little tight with Rough Duck. And then uh, my hope is maybe to crew with Bill next year, if I can talk him into if he can get the time off and we can uh, reboot Team Narwhal from R2AK and get that going. Well, we'd, uh, we would love to have, have you and we'll, we'll figure it out as we go. And, um, I think, it, I think it would be a lot of fun. Uh, most of the time, the big weather comes out of the south. And uh, so that's basically um, basically a big reach and, uh, and can be a whole bunch of fun. I think Rage, everybody I think knows Rage. Rage hit in southerly a number of years ago. I think they said they, they uh, hit 25. So there's a number to shoot for. No, thanks. <laughs> yeah, I'm thinking, oh, yeah, reach with like 30 knots. Yeah. Hmm. <laughs> well, she's almost a catamaran. I mean, if you put, if you built two of her and strapped them together, she'd look like a catamaran. She's so narrow. Yeah. But uh... Vince, you have the rig for that. You could do that. <laughs> Reaching in 20 knots is a lot of fun, guys. <laughs> yeah, 20 knots, okay. 30 knots, okay. <laughs> Uh, just a quick question before we finish up on the big races. When you were saying about going out on racing on Wednesdays and Mondays, uh, has it been the Ballard Cup series that you've been racing yeah. particularly on Mondays? That's what I've been doing. And I've yeah. been doing, you know, uh, Jeff uh, has been doing that as well uh, when he can get his son in there and whatnot. Mm -hmm. uh, totally and then do it single handed sometimes. Yep. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Someone was asking about single handed races. And, and they do have, there are a couple of single handed races that Sloop Tavern does. But, uh, but you can do any of their races single-handed if you want. Okay, cool. Because it would be fun to just be amongst other multi-holes while racing on the weekdays. You know, man, if you want to do a uh, Ballard Cup, we're going to do it. We always, you know, and it's it's just great. Uh, I, I really enjoy it. Um, but it'd be wonderful to have another boat out there. Sounds great. Yeah, I got them all marked right now, spilling the calendar. So, so guys, Next I time. have a question about moorage. If we're doing beer can, we can't, we can't day races my boat is on lake washington which is about three hours away from shilsol and um you know during the summer a lot of people take their boats and go north and there's empty slips all throughout shilsol um does anybody have a line on subletting for a reasonable price for a month to do a series uh just keep my boat out there or other people too talk to me uh, we have B dock and we may have some open space. Okay. Uh, so, uh, I, have, I also have a slip inside over at Salmon Bay Marina. That oh. um, I, I've been holding on to that one for a while just because it's on fresh water and I like that. Sure. So, it's so it's, totally, it's totally possible from there to make the race. I mean, you do have to go through the locks and the locks timing is kind of variable, but that's what I usually do. My slip for the summer is pretty close to Scott. And you can like show up, maybe you have to take off work a little bit early, leave the dock by exactly five or a little <laughs> bit before five. And oh uh, and you can usually, you know, make the, make the race on time, piece of cake. Yeah, sounds good. Uh, I have all the other hurdles of PHRF. So, and I was gonna ask uh, one other thing, going back there, um, if you wanna re regress, uh, you said uh, to do PHRF, you've got a bunch of forms, but that includes like measuring sails. Do you have to measure mast height and what, what sorts of things? That just sounds like a lot of hassle to it's, me. So. It's not a hassle. And, and the club actually through Ballard Sales, and we would have to, I don't know if Scott's talked to them lately about that, but uh, Ballard Sales uh, had told us, the club, that uh, as part of you know, our kind of perks of membership, they would do PHRF measuring for free. So... Um, so I don't, you know, that's, you do have to take all the sails off your boat and you drop them off down there. But, uh, 
so far they they have been doing that for free. Honestly, if you have a stock sale plan uh, and you can kind of, you know, it, it doesn't make any sense to try to rate based on, you know, your sales two inches longer in this or that dimension. I mean, if it's a stock rig and a stock sale plan and you just went to Calvert Sales and got the stock sales, we kind of know what they are. Yeah, mine, mine are Calvert Sales, so. Well, that makes things easier. It's a hassle to get the sales off and transport them. Yeah, I mean, we could probably figure that out. You can measure the sales on the boat. It takes a little imagination. You have to hoist the main. You have to hoist the jib. Uh, But, yeah, you can measure them on the boat. I've done it. Okay. Yeah. Don't let that get in the way if you want to do it. You know, the other thing is to look at the uh, moorage at um, Salmon Bay. I mean, if you wanted to put your boat there for the summer. Their availability is pretty open still, so. Uh-huh. Uh, but you want to you want to get there early. The price is good too. Uh, don't expect to get electricity though. Don't need that. Another option too, Eric. You're inside the lock spit lock haven where I'm at on the Magnolia side. Right down, down on a dock, they usually have summer slips available. Um, probably no power, but you could definitely fit in there. Think about it all. Yeah, and and Paul says he's gonna he's gonna bring his boat out on uh, when isn't that right, Paul? Uh, Monday's my plan. Yep, for the Battle Cup. Cool. Uh, I need to get my sales measured as well, so <laughs> I'll awesome. be in touch. See if you find any shortcuts. Does anybody still have it. their trimaran in the uh, dry dock at Chilshul? Uh Mine's in the dry, and Bill as well. Oh, okay. And I think there's, there, well, there's a couple more, but I, and I assume, I believe they're members, but I'm not sure who they are. Well, you've got Andrew Rice. Andrew uh, Rice. And uh, Bill you know, Lawrence got his boat down there. Bill still yeah, does. Point twos. Yeah. I got yeah. three spots available right now, but I'm number seven on the wait list. So I'm trying to figure out who. His is a 28. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he got some new sales and was looking good. So maybe I'll I'll get ping him see if he wants to come out some uh, Monday nights. It's it's fun. Yeah, because you know, we had you and me and Paul and Jeff and Yuri. And Eric, Shit, we'd have a race on our hands. We'd have a real race. Yeah. Did, did Yuri buy a new boat then? No, no, he just has had this 28. No, um, that's a 27. Oh, is, is it, it a 27? Yeah, because yeah, oh. he had my old name. I wore it out. Gave it to a guy in Lake Tahoe, and then he got it from the guy in Lake Tahoe. <laughs> and he raced that for 10 years. So. Yeah, <laughs> I think he might it. have a new sale. So that's yeah. great. Yeah. Yeah, look at the stats right now. Yeah, it's an F-27. It's totally right. Escape. All right. Escape. Yeah. Escape. Well, I've covered this, the, the kind of stuff that I had hoped to cover. Um, if anybody uh, has more questions about trying to um, you know, get a rating and all that stuff, contact me directly and I'll put you in touch. You know, I'll, I'll hook you up uh, one way or another. Uh, there are uh, definitely but, people in the club that can help guide you through that. That's not, not a big deal. Yeah. And the other thing is, if you're... Uh, you know, concerned about the racing rules, which you haven't talked to uh, at all about, um, and you don't know anything about the racing rules, that's a whole nother subject. Uh, But go out with somebody else and bring, and there's lots of people in the club, I think, who would be willing to come out with you and, and, uh, and sail. And it's honestly, you know, I'm very fortunate in that I have sailed for 20 years with the same people. But you know you can get a little stale. It's always great to sail with somebody else. Oh, so that um, you guys talking we, about to do some racing. We because uh, we hadn't done any racing until we got this boat. And uh, one thing that we did, we took took a couple of uh, the North Sail North U courses about racing rules of sailing because you can read through it, but without having some some visual aids and some instruction on exactly what all that stuff means it was we found it pretty helpful to to actually have some guidance on the racing rules of sailing piece 
Yeah, I I would love to do that North U thing actually, uh, even at this point. The North U stuff is great, uh, and also uh, Dave Dellenbau has been doing uh, one, once a once a night once a week night uh, seminars, uh, and they're really really affordable, and he covers different. Uh, different aspects of just sailing in general racing, but also each, every section has like, oh, here's the several different rules that might apply and it'll do pop quizzes and stuff. It's really great stuff. And, you know, Jeff Jeff laughed about or made fun of, not in a good, bad way, but about how the the weekday races were kind of low stress. And I'll give you this, that uh, our weekday races where we're like, there's 15 boats on a hundred yard start line was not unstressful. It was actually quite stressful. <laughs> Trying to, you know, our boat who picks up speed a lot, you know, pretty quick with a gust and we're out there in Tacoma with nothing but monohulls. So, you know, we get, uh, we get to go play with that. And when the gust hits us, we, you know, pick up speed and they just heal over. You know, it was, it was not unstressful. I'll just say that. We're getting better. Try, try the same thing and port start it. Yeah. <laughs> we did a, whole, uh, a big old 360 right on the start line one night. It worked great. Um, there were some people that were a little irritated, but it was legal. But uh, yeah, it was, uh, like I said, there's, there was some learning that needed to be done. I think, I think learning the, uh, you know, when you start learning the, gr- the rules before you go is a great idea. I think when you start, even though you know the rules, I think it's a good idea not to really to push them for a while. I mean, if you want to learn the rules and go out and be super aggressive, you know, you kind of pick the wrong boat to do that with, unless, you know, you have a lot of disposable income and good insurance, but, um, you know, just you're starting out, you know, learn the rules and you guys had some great suggestions about where to learn about those. And, and, and frankly, going out with some people who know what they're doing is a great way to do it too. get, you know, kind of, you know, get your chops that way. But, you know, just go out, have fun, be relaxed about it. Don't push it. You know, if you have a question about whether you're port or starboard and you just don't you just go below them, you know, just go around them. You know, there's uh, just don't push it. I've, I I've taken North my... Sail classes and, and they are excellent. Highly recommend them. I think the books are fantastic. If you don't own them, they have one on sail trim, one on race tactics. Both of them are great but it's not how to learn how to race. I mean, really, it's like a reference guide for, oh shit, what happened afterwards? And you can actually go up and look to see what happened to you or what your troubles were. But I mean, there's nothing that's gonna replace the real thing. Great. Well, if um, I think we are at a point where we can kind of wrap this meeting up. I really appreciate everybody's uh, time and really um, appreciate you Vince what a great presentation tonight. I had, Thank you. I had one I had one more question I guess for Joe um, because I've also de-armed my automatic life vest you had said that the safety at sea seminar you had made a decision to rearm them to be automatically could you talk just a little bit about that yeah you bet <clears throat> so we took the safety at sea online course we're doing the uh, in-person thing in, uh, oh, on the 13th, I guess. But I read uh, Pat McGarry's account of the capsize of a Dragonfly, and uh, you know I, I thought it was pretty concerning. And being able to get out from under a boat when you're capsized and you've got this inflated life jacket it seemed like a pretty uncomfortable position to be in. And actually, I still agree with that. But the bigger danger is falling overboard and the gas reflex. You need to be buoyant as soon as you fall overboard or you'll start choking on water. Uh, Now, if you've got a dry suit, that's got a lot of buoyancy in it. And that may be sufficient to get your head above water. my boat is a very big bat stable condomoran. It's not going to capsize. I've tried a couple of times, uh, but it's not <laughs> going to capsize. The danger 
on any boat, actually, the bigger danger is falling over the side. And I'm not going to fall over the side on my boat either. I've got jack lines. I've got tethers. I've got attachment points. I'm not going to fall over the side. I've got lifelines. Uh, but just the same, that's a bigger danger than capsizing my boat. And with that in mind, just looking at the actuarial prospects of it, I guess, uh, we decided to go back to the automatic inflation. Uh, if we had dry suits and, and kayak vests, we have kayak vests, by the way, uh, and we thought about using those. Those are awfully bulky to sail in. And we use them for our kayaks, but we don't use them for sailing on deck. Uh, and I don't want to steer anybody in the wrong direction, but that's, that's where we ended up going back to the automatic inflatables. Thanks. Yeah, I, I'm a big fan of the kayak vest. I did see a couple boats in the Bay Area this last fall, and they had, you know, the large 35 pound PFDs mounted to the bottom of the trampolines, which I thought was kind of a smart thing, um, just as like a precaution. But the people on board were wearing kayak vests. I really like Vince's kayak vest. It has the, the D rings on it for a tether. Um, for some sort of jack line, which I don't know if you can throw out a link to in the just in the uh, chat to what those are, but there was also uh, there was a guy that had gave uh, a presentation to this club several years ago, and he had capsized, and it was him and Wayne sort of doing a ham and egg thing about their experience uh, about their capsize, and he had. Uh, in inflatable vests on, but then lit off a flare as he's standing on his upside down boat and the sparks from the flare deflated his vest. Oh, and that to me screams, why are we wearing inflatable vests for two reasons? You know, it just sounds like a bad idea. Either that or the inflate or the uh, incendiary flare is a bad idea. Well, a little bit of both. I think it was pre, uh, you know, strobe flare, but yeah. definitely something. Something else to be concerned about. When you know, I we've got all that stuff. We've got flares. We don't have the uh, the light, the uh, LED uh, electronic flares. We don't have those yet. We'll probably get them. Uh, so we have a lot of things to consider. We carry immersion suits from our days when we were fishing. Uh, so if it were getting really bad, we'd probably climb into our immersion suits. Uh, keep us afloat and keep us warm for some extended period of time, I suppose. Uh, we've got lots of options, and I suppose what we really need to do is come up with a regular uh, a plan of what we're going to do rather than having to think about it at the spur of the moment. The take away, to, to, the take away to add to this, uh, if I can, um, our biggest problem when we're racing is pitch pulling. And quite a few guys I know that have pitch pulled have ended up under the netting or had crew under the netting, Wayne Gorey, for example, off of Race Rocks. And uh, in every case, they were really glad that they did not have uh, either a life vest or an inflatable life vest inflated at that time. We had the adder problem in the old days when they weren't so good. We'd have the inflatable ones go, automatic inflatable ones go off while on deck because our deck was a little damp, shall we say. <laughs> now they got parametric ones, but we uh, took safety at sea course and uh, one of the guys off Bad Kitty uh, uh, went in with a brand new $500 vest, wouldn't go off. And they eventually were standing on his head, pushing him a meter underwater, trying to get him to, uh, trying to get to inflate. He just says, hey, he took that one back and got his money back and bought a different brand. But just want to point out that none of these solutions is anywhere near 100%. Um, one thing I can't see, I haven't heard anybody uh, actually suffer from, the, from the, the cold water reflex. Of course, I guess the ones that die don't come back to tell you, but uh, it seems to be overwhelmingly it's problems getting washed off the boat or pitch pulled under, under the netting and uh, having to deal with immediate issues before you get your life vest sorted. Anyway, my two cents worth. When we took the safety at sea class uh, where you actually had to get into a pool, one third of the automatic inflating <laughs> jackets did not inflate. 
Yeah, that would just, and the instructor said that was pretty common. Nigel Barron at CSR told me the same thing when they were preparing for Switzer a couple of years ago. They all have manual and players as well. Yeah, it's true. A good takeaway on this whole inflatable auto inflation, manual inflation scenario is that people are thinking about it. The boats that we sail, the conditions that we sail in, the gear that we're wearing when we get in it, uh, we started wearing dry suits on cuttlefish in 2001 and we just ended up making it a requirement that anybody on the boat that was going to crew with us was going to wear a dry suit and you know, we had a little bit of pushback occasionally they didn't want to rent one or what and i said fine you know don't rent one don't get on the boat i don't care <laughs> and if you wear a dry suit sailing and you have a life jacket on, I strongly suggest that somebody shove you off the boat to see what happens when you hit the water. If you've got an inflatable and it auto inflates, you are all kinds of screwed up as far as buoyancy is concerned. The dry suit has way more buoyancy than a standard offshore life preserver. And the first thing that you end up doing is grabbing the neck collar and burping out half the air that's inside the suit. You are not going to be shocked, other than the fact that your face is going to be surprised when it hits the water, by the cold weather shock, cold water shock. We started wearing dry suits not because it was a great uh, safety thing. We wore them because it was very, very comfortable. We also discovered that our expectancy, functional expectancy in the water went from a matter of uh, an hour, if that, to a dozen hours. Uh, we, we just, <laughs> we knew that we were going to get wet. We knew that we were in exposed conditions. We knew that we were going to be experiencing wind chill. And uh, to me, it just seemed like a no brainer. It took quite a bit of screwing around trying to figure out how to make the inflatable life jacket compatible with the dry suit. And all of the people that regularly sailed on cuttlefish and the people who regularly sailed on uh, either of the 31s that we had had been in the water with their dry suit and an inflatable life jacket. Mike Wright wore one of the first kayak vests that uh, I knew of, and that was that kind of thing that looked like a little mini chest protector. And it was perfect for him, even when he managed to step backwards off the bow. And uh, <laughs> I reached down and fished him out when he got to the back of the boat. But, you know, other than being a little embarrassed, none the worse for wear. I just say, if you wear a dry suit, go in the water and find out what happens when you're in the water. It is. You know, I tried really hard to get Swiftsure uh, safety, in, you know, to to not require the 33 pound um, inflatables, but I didn't get anywhere. May I ask um, for you seasoned racers, uh, what you recommend to use as a throwable on board? I'm sorry, Scott. Say that again. Uh, throwable. Uh, PFD, a throwable PFD. I thought you were talking about beer there for a minute. <laughs> no, he's talking about the, I, I just use the horseshoe buoy. The horseshoe? Yeah. yeah that's, that's what I have right now. Okay. You know, and I've got the, the, uh, the thing, the throwing line and a life sling, but you know, like we were talking last meeting, it's all about getting out there and practicing sure. and that's what I got to do, you know? I, I think I think you got to check the regs on your race too. I mean, every like Vince was talking about earlier. I mean, every race is going to have you know a set of rules, and they're all a little different, and depends on what kind kind of conditions you're going to be sailing in and expecting. So you know the rules for swift shore, near shore versus offshore, and things like that. They're all a little different. I just got this lot, yeah. buoy right now. So. Yeah, that's the one. That's it. Okay. Yep. For instance, I think, I don't know if they still do them, but I think, wasn't there a restaurant in Lake Washington, Anthony's, that used to do a race? I'm pretty sure there were no rules for that one. 
<laughs> show up in your you know, bikini or shorts or whatever you want to do and you know, do your thing and then you're done. So, Man, of course, you know, sailing on Lake Washington is different than sailing on the Sound. Temperatures are different. Conditions are different. Chances of rescue are different, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So I think with when it comes to gear, whether it's dry suits or life jackets or whatever, um, one, each bit of kit has its own little pieces of stuff that needs to get done. Dry suits need to be burped. Inflatables need to be tested. Um, you know, a cat is going to have different uh, requirements or desires than a trimaran, and each boat and each crew is going to have to make their own decisions as to what really works good for their boat. But it's going to take, you know, a concerted effort to think about what's really going to work and try out what does and doesn't work on each individual. That's kind of a, I think, yeah. that's becoming a more individualistic thing. There isn't one thing that works good on every boat, on every boat, whether it's all multis, all monos, both, neither, whatever. That's just my thoughts on it. But let's also remember that regarding SERs, there's a fair amount of fluidity that was mentioned earlier in the meeting. And <clears throat> what we face every year with, uh, with our race is to adjust the SERs to meet the conditions we, we foresee and also we get input from some very experienced racers in both our group and other, other places. So it can be adjusted and it can be made appropriate for the, the fleets, even if there's differences within the fleets. So they can, be, they can be dealt with as long as they end up with something that's safe. Just out right, of curiosity, uh, does anyone else have a life raft? Nope. Survival suits and dry suits. Anybody who's looking for one, I have a brand new one, an eight person. So. Eight person is a lot for a race boat. Yeah, I think I, I think Scott, you ought to you ought to you ought to carry that on your seven sixty, man. Dude, it will weigh it down. It will weigh it down. Well, so it depends on the race he's doing. I mean, I think if he's going to Hawaii, I mean, don't they require him for you know? And again, it kind of depends. Well, you know what they say um, about life, life vests are kind of like, you know, camping tents. If it's a four person, it's really only good for two. So if I have a four person crew, it will be really comfortable. Yeah, man. I, I will tell you one thing, because uh, my neighbor down the street uh, was getting rid of an old life raft and I've never really seen the inside of one. So I brought it home and I popped it open and dug it through, dug through all that. And all I could think of is you don't really want to have to be in a situation where you actually have to use it. I mean, it inflates uh, and it's a, but you know, there's like one little paddle that's like about this big and there's like, you know, like a little butter knife that I assume is all blunt and not sharp because they don't want you stabbing your companion when you want, when yeah. you get hungry and, <laughs> and there's, there's like, you know, you know, no food. I mean, you know, if you're out there in that thing, it really is just basic survival. They're not, I don't think they're comfortable. Sure. doesn't look like it. The safety at sea course taught us that. The, the, the life rafts they had were not appealing. I spent five days in a life raft, so I can assure you that you don't want to ever do it more than once. Wow. You, we can have you back and you can tell us about that in another meeting, right? Yeah. Good. All right. We'll All see right. you uh, March 1st. <laughs> All right. All hey, right and also, Scott, I'm going to be contacting you about that raft because we always end up with some needs for the race that would be great it's a brand new it's a brand new piece of equipment uh we just uh put it on one of our sea wind uh 42 footers and uh the guy decided that it was too bulky so, what brand uh, yeah what brand is it it is oh man i knew we were gonna it's all right i'll contact you and you can we can get the details uh, i'll text my number in the uh, main chat right now so you can just give me a call later perfect Did uh, I just wondering? It sounds like we're winding down. Did Patty and Joel are there? Did we get a report from them down there in Mexico? They were in La Cruz. I barely missed them. No. I don't know if they're listening. Uh, are they still on? Yeah, I'm, I'm here. Patty, hey. Patty went to bed. We're actually we're so far south and east that we're in Central Time Zone now. So it's it's almost eleven o'clock, which is kind of crazy. East. Yeah. So where are you? We are about 100 miles south of, of Puerto Vallarta in Tenacatina, oh, well. which wow. is a beautiful anchorage. We've got, there's like 50 boats plus in this anchorage and it accommodates them just fine. 